it's amazing to have the opportunity to speak to so many uh, students from Russia, from Brazil, from other countries around the world, all on the internet, which is uh, the magic of our new technology. So uh, thank you very much, Irina, for asking me to, to be here uh, and to give a presentation. I'll give a little bit more of an introduction about myself at the end. I think you're more interested in hearing what I have to say and less hearing about me. So I'll just launch right into my presentation. I'd like to speak with you today about the moral geography of the Arctic. My background is in philosophy. I'm a philosopher. And so I think about the Arctic sometimes in a philosophical way and about Arctic geography in a philosophical way. And I think that there are ethical considerations um, to bear in mind when we think about, about the way in which we think about the Arctic. And that's what I'd like to speak with you about today. I think this is important if we are going to uh, understand how we should ask questions about sustainable development in the Arctic, which is the theme of this summer school, or uh, how we approach the Arctic in general. So all of you who are here, and I hope thinking about um, a career or studies involving the North, or you live in the North, um, this will be of interest and use to you. So the first thing I'd like to do is ask you to close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes, but picture the Arctic in your mind. If, you, if it helps to close your eyes, do that. Whatever the Arctic means to you, whatever the circumpolar north means to you, close your eyes and picture it in your mind. Now here are some, you can open your eyes now if you've had them closed. And I wonder what the Arctic looked like in your imagination. Here are some pictures from what we would consider to be the Russian North or the Russian Arctic. Um, the, the far northern coast near the Lena River, near the Delta, um, Arctic peoples, um, the Palisades of the Lena in the Sakha Republic, Yakutia, um, the, I forgot which city this is in, in Yakutia. I forgot the name of it, but this is an Arctic city. These are some pictures of the Arctic and they all have different, um, they all look quite different. There, there are different aspects to the Arctic. There's, there's a natural aspect and a human aspect to it. And I, you know, your imagination of the Arctic might have fit into one of these categories or maybe it's something different. So the Arctic is very varied, as we know. It's, it has a lot of elements to it. But I, I wonder what sort of place is it? And we're trying to understand the meaning of the Arctic as a place. This is what I want to present to you. I want to try to uncover the moral geography of the Arctic, like I said. But in order to do this, we have to understand what the meaning of the Arctic is as a place. Now, in English, place, the word place, means, has a lot of different meanings, has a lot of different connotations. Perhaps it's the same in Russian or in your language, but certainly in English, you can use place in many different ways and express many different things with the word. Uh, we can talk, for example, of our place, which is to connect people together with place. We can talk about nice places, in which case we're making an expression of aesthetic value or emotional value that a place has. We can talk in English about something being in the right place, that is to say where it belongs, which means we're making a claim about the right order of things. In English, we can even tell someone that they should know their place or take their place, which is an expression of power. So the word in English has many different meanings and therefore it's difficult to understand. Perhaps again, this is the same in Russian or in your language, that the word for place has many different meanings and it makes it very difficult to understand. So we want to know what exactly is place. And in this way, if we can understand what place is, we can understand what the Arctic is as a place. And then once we understand what the Arctic is as a place, or try to, then we can uncover the moral or ethical dimensions of its geography, which are important as we try to approach it as a place. So what exactly is place? Well, as I said, it's difficult to understand place. And so I'd like to introduce a little bit of geographical theory. And I think it's helpful if we want to understand place by starting 
to try to understand what the place is not. <laughs> place is not space. In English, we make a distinction between place and space. And in English, a space suggests a definable area. It's more abstract than place. A place is something concrete. A space is something abstract. And we can speak in English of blank spaces or empty spaces. Maybe you can in Russian as well or in your language. So space can be specified. Space can be defined. But it's not something that's lived in. It's not something that's felt. And place is something that's lived in and place is something that's felt. So that's why place and space are different. And the other thing that place is not is place is not landscape. This is another word we use in English when we're talking about things like this, like locations and places and spaces and landscapes. These words go together. But place is not the same thing as landscape. Because a landscape, like the one you see here, which is of a landscape in New Zealand, this suggests a portion of the Earth's surface that we can see all at once. We, we can see from our vantage point. And because landscape is this, this portion of the Earth's surface that we see from outside, we're not in it. A landscape is not something that we're in. It's something that we observe, it's something that we see, but it's not something that we are in, in the same way that we are in a place. So you do not live in a landscape or feel it in the same way that you live in or feel place. And all of this suggests that what is missing from space, what is missing from landscape, are the people in it. And the, what makes place special and different is that place and people go together. You cannot separate people from place because it is people who make places. People live in places, they feel them, they do things in them, and it makes the place. So place and people cannot be separated. That's the first thing that we have to understand about place. And so in this way, when we talk about place and people having to go together, we, one good way of thinking about place, therefore, is to think about it as a location that has a meaning. What makes a place, the way a person or people make places is by giving them meanings. You give a location a meaning, you make it a place. And here's the difference. Uh, on the left, you see a location. Location 62 degrees north, 129 and two thirds degrees east. That is the location of the Arctic State Agrotechnological University in Yakutsk. And there it is on a map. You can program this location into a computer. A computer can understand this location. But a meaningful location, a location with meaning, that is a place that can only be understood by people. And there it is, the Arctic State Technological University, which is, which is hosting us today. This university as a place can only be understood by people. And a geographer who studies place, his name is Tim Cresswell. He's a, a British geographer and he studies place and writes books about this idea. He said something that I find very interesting, that you can program a cruise missile a weapon can be programmed with a location and it can find it. But a weapon cannot be programmed with a place. And if you could program the weapon to understand the place, perhaps it would not wish to destroy it. So that's the difference between location and meaningful location. A location can be programmed into a computer, but a meaningful location can only be understood by people. That's what makes a place. People make places. So if we want to understand the Arctic as a place, we're going to have to understand what people make of it, okay? But let's keep going with this idea. So there are three concepts to, a compo to, to place if we think of it as a meaningful location. Every place has three parts if it is a meaningful location. It has the location itself. That's one part of the place. It is somewhere. Every place is somewhere. Sometimes that might not be a fixed place because if you are on a ship, for example, you are in a place, but that ship may be moving across the sea. And so a location does not have to be fixed, but it is somewhere and every place has to be somewhere. Um, places also have what is called locale. Places have a form, a topography, 
That might be a natural topography, such as hills or mountains or plains or the vegetation. It could be uh, a human-made topography, buildings, for example, in a city. But every place has a material form, of course. But finally, a place, and this is where the meaning comes in, especially. Every place has a sense of place, a sense of what it is like to be in it. We know as people what it is like to be in a particular place. And that's the, the bit where a lot of, our, of the meaning of the place is located. So a place as a meaningful location has three components, location, locale, and sense of place. And if we take these ideas seriously, that a place is a meaningful location and that it has these three components, then we can understand that the idea of place is complex and the idea of place has, uh, comes in many categories. And here are the categories that a place can be. And this is a bit technical, so let me go through it a little bit carefully. What I want to say is that the idea of place has three aspects. It has an ontological sense, and this comes from the Greek word onta, meaning things that exist. So place is a way of existing or being in the world. This, of course, respond, corresponds to the location that a place has and to the locale, its material topography. Okay, this is, a place is an ontological category. You can, you can refer to things that exist in the world right, through their place, through a place. But place is not just a way that you specify what exists. This place exists, that place exists. That's not all you do with the idea of place. Place is also a way of knowing the world because places have meanings and therefore places are ways of understanding the world. And therefore place has an epistemological category. Uh, place is an epistemological category. This comes from the Greek word episteme, meaning knowledge. So place is a way of knowing the world, and this corresponds to the, to the sense of place that we've talked about. And it refers to the collection of meanings that we give to places by doing things in them. Okay. So place is also a way of knowing the world, as well as specifying what exists in the world. And then finally, and what is important for me here in this presentation that I want to give you today, is that place, the notion of place, and this might be surprising to you, but place also is a moral category. Place is a way in which we judge human action in the world, judge it to be right or wrong. Because some things are right in some places and they are wrong in other places. So for example, often in a church, it's not, it is, you have to uh, speak softly or wear certain clothes. You cannot wear a hat or short sleeves or, sh or short uh, trousers. This is not appropriate in the church because of the place. So it is the place through which we are judging human action. And some places can be, um, have meanings that allow us to, to judge human action. They imply rules about what is in place or what is out of place. Okay, so place is a very complicated notion. You might have thought that place was only, a, a place is something that exists, and that's true. It has an ontological sense, but it also has a meaning. Places have meanings, and therefore, places are ways in which we know the world and ways in which we judge human action in the world. There is a moral sense to place as well. And this is important for us because if we now under, want to understand the Arctic as a place, the North as a place, and we talk about things that we want to do there, sustainable development or other kinds of activities, well, there will be, activi there will be ways in which that we approach the Arctic that can be wrong and ways in which we approach and act within the Arctic that can be right. And this depends on the meaning of the place. So this is what I want to speak with you about in more detail today, okay? Now, if that all makes sense, and I hope it does, what I want to return to now, I've talked very generally, theoretically, about the notion of place in general. Now I want to talk about a specific place. I want to talk about the Arctic as a place. What is the Arctic as a place? What is it as a meaningful location? What kind of meaning 
is attached to the Arctic. And let's then try to tease out from that some implications, uh, moral implications, ethical implications that we can derive from our understanding of what the Arctic means. Well, in Western culture anyway, the Arctic has many meanings. We've given the Arctic many meanings. One of the meanings that we've given to the Arctic in Western culture at any rate is that is the fragile wilderness to be protected. That is what the Arctic means. It is a fragile wilderness to be protected. That's what it is as a place. And protected at all costs. But at the same time, in Western culture, we've thought about the Arctic in other ways, not as a place to be protected, but as a place to be conquered, or where human limits can be conquered, where men, especially men, this is quite a masculine meaning that is given to the Arctic, where men go to test themselves and, and where nature can be conquered as a heroic place. And this is a meaning that we have given to the Arctic. And if you look at these pictures, in fact, one picture is of Adolf Nordenskjold, a, a, a 19th century explorer. And the other, Ranulf Fiennes, who is a 20th century a British explorer from 2014. So more than, more than 100 years, 125 years or so, separates these two men. But the picture is the same. Notice a man, and they're all men mostly, staring off into the distance, testing himself, his mind, his, his body, conquering nature. This is a meaning that we have in Western culture also given to the Arctic. Another meaning that we have given in Western culture to the Arctic is as an inhospitable place, an unforgiving place, a harsh place, a cruel place where animals that are savage live and where people who are like animals live. The word in English, as you see all, all here, is savage, savage. And you have these polar bears in that picture. This picture was painted in Britain at the time of the Franklin expedition, which was lost in Canada. And this artist is imagining what had happened to them, eaten by polar bears. Um, they look a bit like giant ferrets, actually, more than the polar bears. But it's, a, it's a, quite a gruesome picture. It hangs at the Royal Holloway, I believe, a university at, near London or just on the outskirts of London and it hangs in a room that is often used for examinations. <laughs> and they have to cover the picture, I, I understand, during exam, exam time, because it, it's, it's, it, um, it's so gruesome that it, it, it stresses out the, the, <laughs> the students who are taking their examinations in the room. So this is a, another picture of the Arctic, another meaning that we have given to the Arctic. When you close your eyes and you imagine the Arctic, maybe you also imagined it as one of these things, fragile wilderness or a heroic place or an unforgiving place where savage animals live. Or maybe you thought about it in this way as a treasure chest. This is another meaning that we have given the Arctic in Western culture. A treasure chest full of valuable natural resources. Anything that you could imagine that we need, oil, gas, diamonds. This is a diamond mine in, in um, the Republic of Sahara, Yakutia this picture, um, cobalt, platinum, palladium, lead, zinc, mm -hmm. gold, silver, copper, all kinds of different resources, rubies, um, uranium, rare earth metals. All of these different resources are there in the Arctic. Fish, timber in the taiga parts. It is a treasure chest to be exploited. This is another meaning. And if you notice, this meaning has a it stands in tension with the meaning of the, of the Arctic as a fragile wilderness. And that's why people think it's important to talk about sustainable development in the Arctic. But this, yet, yeah, this is another meaning. And this meaning also goes together with this idea that oh, the Arctic is a place that has not yet been claimed. A terra nullius in Latin, no man's land, some place that belongs to nobody. A lot of people in the West, especially who are not from Arctic states, Think about the Arctic as a place that is yet to be claimed, yet to be annexed. So there it is, able for us to take it. This is another meaning that has gone into the Arctic. And you, if you study the Arctic, you might recognize some of these maps of the Central Arctic Ocean. 
this goes together with another meaning that we have given the Arctic, especially during the Cold War, but again uh, now, as a place, because it is not claimed, that might be a place where war can happen. It's a military frontier. As all of the states who wish to claim the Arctic try to do so, there's the potential for conflict. And that two of the, two of the uh, countries that are involved here also have nuclear weapons. So this is potentially a very dangerous conflict. So the Arctic is a, is a dangerous place that, that, is, that could be fought over. This is another meaning or understanding of the Arctic as place that we have. Especially, I think, this was uh, a meaning that had been given to the Arctic. It was very clear during the Cold War. But again, it is re-emerging. These images that I've put up, these are not old. These are very new. And I think perhaps now, amongst most people in the West, the Arctic has, um, the, the first thing that people think about the Arctic is as a place where climate change is happening. This is the place we have to save from climate change because if we can save the Arctic from climate change, then we save ourselves. So the Arctic in this meaning becomes a backdrop, a scenery for a on a stage for a, a play, a morality play, like in a theater, this is the scenery in a theater of a play of disaster, of salvation and redemption. We have to save the Arctic so that we can save our, ourselves. And this is a very common meaning that people have given to the Arctic now, the canary in the coal mine of climate change. And there are lots of images that circulate of the Arctic like this. And I want you to look very carefully at this image of the polar bear, because this photograph is a fake. Look very carefully at it, it is a fake. You can tell this by looking at the shadow of the polar bear, it's not correct. But this image, the idea of the last polar bear, the polar bear that is starving and drowning, is a potent now, it's a potent image in Western culture. And even though this image is a fake, it's been used in news articles. It, I've even found it in a, in a university textbook, presented as though it were real. And I know it's a fake because you can just go to the website where you find the image, it's on a photography stock image website. And not only does the person who made it make this available for sale, he also makes all the component parts available for sale so you can make your own image. So it's, it's all constructed, but people believe it because this is the way they wish to see the Arctic. And this is the meaning that we have given it, the canary in the coal mine of climate change. So there are lots of meanings that we have given to the Arctic in Western culture. But the interesting thing about all of these meanings, all of these Arctic imaginaries, a geographer and or a social scientist will often use the term imaginaries to describe the, the meanings that we have given to places, these Arctic imaginaries. You notice that all of them that I've shown you, which are typical in Western culture, don't have people in them. They don't have people in them. Or if they do, these are people who are like animals. So this is a problem, of course, because as we know, and you can see from these maps, there is a human Arctic. Many of you perhaps in this, uh, who are attending this live in the human Arctic. You're well aware of this, but this is not something that many other people are well aware of. Sometimes I give this presentation and I show the, the map on the right hand side, which shows the number of people living in the Arctic. And I, you add up those numbers and it's about 4 million. It's about the, still about the same as it was when this map was, was first drawn. And I say to people, you know, there are 4 million people who live in the Arctic. And I say this to people from Britain or, or from Southern places, and they're very surprised to hear this. They're very surprised. They thought maybe there were people there. Of course, there are some, but they live uh, in traditional lives. Certainly they don't live in cities, maybe in igloos or something like that. And there are very few. They're very, very surprised to find out that there are cities in the Arctic and 4 million people. This is not surprising, I think, to most Russians because 2 million of those people live in Russia and they live in large cities and Russians are aware of this. But in Britain, it's a bit of a surprise. In other places, it's a bit of a surprise. So there exists a human Arctic, of course, but all of the imaginaries that I've shown you, all of the meanings that are current, the way that people think about the Arctic don't involve people. And this is a problem. And now you can see where the moral, moral problems can arise. If we think about the Arctic as a place without people in it, then the way in which we approach the Arctic 
It might be wrong, it might be morally wrong. Now, I want to introduce to you to, perhaps you've already heard of him, he's a, a recently deceased, a very famous scholar named Edward Said. And he wasn't writing about the Arctic. Edward Said was writing about the Middle East and he wrote a very famous book called Orientalism in the 1970s. Um, and in this book, he describes not the meanings that we've given to the Arctic, but the meanings that Western culture has given to the Middle East. And today we would call them imaginaries. He called it Orientalism, a kind of a constructed idea of the Middle East with its own tradition of thought, imagery, and vocabulary, as he said. And it's a, this is a style of thinking about the Middle East that is based on, look at these words he uses, ontological and epistemological distinction between the Orient and the Occident, the East and the West. And this way of thinking about the Middle East that he details in his book was used, this style of thinking is as he put it, a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Middle East, over the, over the Orient, over its territory, its resources, and its peoples. And those of us who are not, um, come from cultures that are not Arctic cultures, our imagination of the way the Arctic is can also be used as a way to understand the Arctic in such a way as to dominate it, as to have authority over it, as to, as to take for ourselves the right to define what the Arctic is and to use it. Because our imaginaries don't have people in them. Our Arctic imaginaries don't have people in them. And so I would call this a borealism. He, Edward Said called his imaginaries of the Middle East that he identified, he called it an orientalism. I will call this a borealism. There is a borealism, boreal from the word for north in Latin. There is a borealism in the way that we, which we approach the Arctic our imaginaries that I outlined to you, I think add up to a borealism. And I want to talk to you about what, I think this has moral implications. I think this has important moral implications when we think about how we want to approach the Arctic. If you talk about sustainable development in the Arctic, what are you talking about? And I want to illustrate to you the moral implications that come from understanding the Arctic in the ways that I've laid out. I think, for example, here are some examples, Borealism has had a, a dangerous influence over the way we treat the Arctic. So I've given some examples, one from Canada, where I'm from, one, one from Russia, because we're being hosted by a Russian university, and the one which is global. So in Canada, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the high Arctic relocations. Um, there was a concern in the early 20th century, this was uh, in the night, well, sorry, this was in the 1950s. Um, but there was a concern in the first part of the 20th century about whether or not Canada's claim to the high Arctic was, uh, would be upheld in international law because many parts of the high Arctic in Canada had been explored by Norwegians and by Americans. And so the concern was that perhaps the Norwegians and the Americans actually had a better claim to these islands than Canada did. And Canada thought, well, the best way for us to to strengthen our claim to the high Arctic islands would be to put Canadian people there or people for whom the Canadian government was responsible. Well, who was going to go there? Well, they were already Inuit living in the Arctic. So would we just relocate some of these Inuit up to those islands? And so they did. <clears throat> because the Arctic is the Arctic is the Arctic, isn't it? It's just a wilderness. It's the same everywhere. The people are the same. So they could go and live anywhere, but of course, the high Arctic islands were many, many hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from northern Quebec, which is also Arctic, um, but a different kind of Arctic. Um, and so the people who were locate, relocated from northern Quebec up to these islands, many of them starved because the landscape was different, the animals were different, the seasons were different, and they did not know how to survive there as, as well. But for a Westerner, for a Southerner from Canada, what was the difference? It all looked the same. The Arctic was the Arctic was the Arctic. Um, an example in Russia would have been to use uh, Novaya Zemlya for nuclear testing. Several, uh, two, over 200 nuclear weapons were detonated on Novaya Zemlya for testing. Um, because this space was a space that no one lived in. It was a no man's land. It was nobody's and it was a bit of a, a wasteland. What else would you do? 
with this island. These are dangerous ways of thinking about the Arctic. And all around the world, as an example, um, protests over seal hunting um, ignored the fact we have to stop sealing, we have to stop killing seals uh, because there's something immoral about killing seals, ignoring the fact, of course, that Arctic people, especially the Inuit of Greenland and nor in Northern Canada, depended on hunting seals for, for their livelihoods. And this had terrible uh, effects on their communities when the ban on sealing was brought into place in the 70s and the 80s. But what does it matter? The, the, the Arctic peoples are traditional, they hunt seal in traditional ways, this has nothing to do with them. These are imaginaries that we have of the Arctic people not actually knowing what things are really like. And I want to talk about it a little bit, um, these imaginaries that lead us to make bad decisions. And I want to focus on this global uh, issue that I mentioned here, this uh, example of, of the seal hunt. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the seal ban, the ban on, on trading seal fur, and the effect that it had on people in northern Canada and in Greenland, and what this reveals about the way we think about the Arctic um, and the problems that our, our imaginaries bring when we think about the Arctic. So I want to, I want to talk about that. So let me give you a bit of background. I'm talking about Inuit people uh, who live across uh, the um, North American Arctic from Greenland all across Northern Canada and Alaska and into uh, their small communities in Chukotka. Uh, the Inuit uh, in Canada and Greenland especially uh, depended on seals for their livelihood. And they mostly hunt uh, a species of seal that we call the ring seal. In Inuktitut, it's called Natselk. And this type of seal lives in the Arctic all year round. Not all seals do. Um, some seals don't live in the Arctic at all. Some seals only move up north during the northern summer. But the ring seal lived in the Arctic all year round, and it could be hunted all year round uh, from holes in the ice, traditionally, as you see in the traditional picture on the left. Um, and, and in the picture on the right from Greenland, um, the seal is also still being hunted at its breathing hole, but of course with modern equipment, a rifle rather than a harpoon. Okay, and the seal was used for meat. Uh, it was eaten, all of it. Uh, the fur was used to make clothing, especially uh, the waterproof boots um, that Inuit were famous for. And even its fat was rendered into oil to be used as fuel in lamps. So the seal was a very, very important animal to traditional Inuit uh, life and in traditional Inuit culture. Now in the 1950s and to the 1970s, Inuit people were moved into villages. They used to live uh, on the land in uh, a way following the animals that they depended on. But Denmark, which still runs Greenland and Canada, especially also the United States, um, encouraged settlement into villages in order to uh, be able to um, effect, effectively deliver services in the North and, and demonstrate uh, that they had a claim to and control over the North. Now, <clears throat> the, this is a picture of a, of a village in Northern Canada. It's a bit old, but they don't look in terribly different still. Um, these villages, of course, made separated the Inuit from the animals on which they depended. Um, now you're in one place, you are no longer moving from place to place uh, during the year where the animals were likely to be. You had to go out now and find the animals. So you are separated from the animals that your traditional life uh, involves if you live in a village. And this concentration was a government policy. This was not particularly the choice of Inuit, but it was, it was government policy uh, that Inuit should be living in villages. Now, because they were separated from the animals, they didn't stop hunting. Inuit you know, are very resourceful people, but hunting needed to be more efficient. Uh, if you were going to go out hunting and you needed to go and find the animals, you needed better transportation and you needed to be sure that you were going to be successful. So your hunting gear, a rifle, is, is much more efficient than a bow and arrow or a harpoon. So Inuit you know, began to adopt snowmobiles, um, motorboats, rifles as part of their their traditional life. This was still, a, this was an adaptation of traditional life. 
Uh, this wasn't something giving up traditional life. This is, was a way to sustain traditional life just using new equipment. Now, this new equipment, of course, had to be bought rather than made. So this new equipment required money. And now, because Inuit lived in villages, if one wanted to continue the hunting life and the traditional life, one had to have money in order to continue it. Fortunately for Inuit people, in 1961, a Norwegian inventor created a process for tanning seal pelts uh, to preserve them so that they could be more easily uh, made into uh, luxury items. Seal was used in luxury coat for luxury coats and, and other luxury items by uh, sold uh, in Europe and in Russia and in the United States and in Canada as luxury items for people to wear. Um, and this Norwegian process for tanning seal pelts made them very useful as a fur for these sorts of items. And that raised the demand for seal fur. So this gave the Inuit a way to sell some of the produce from their hunt in order to buy the equipment they needed to continue a traditional lifestyle. So this was a win for everyone. They could sell the ring seal pelts that they were not using. Some of them were still used to make some clothes but not all of them, um, the Inuit were hunting and eating uh, more seal than they needed the, the fur from. So the fur could be sold. And that sale of that fur then generated money, generating money from the traditional lifestyle, from the traditional hunt, generating money in order to buy the equipment that was needed to continue a traditional lifestyle. This was adaptation. Not, this was change, but this was not modernization and giving up old ways. This was Inuit remaining Inuit, defining their culture and their traditional uh, way of life in a new style that was a response to the village life that they had been brought into by the Canadian government and the Danish government. But of course, as you probably know, um, the hunt for seal was not uh, was considered to be um, cruel by many people in the South. Partly because the most expensive seal pelts and the most demanded seal pelts were these white coat pelts. These are the pups of harp seals. Harp seals uh, only spend part of their lives in the Arctic. And the Inuit didn't particularly hunt harp seals. They hunted ring seals in the wintertime. Harp seals move up to the north in the, in the summertime. It's much harder to hunt seals in the water. So harp seals were, were not um, the, the common uh, animal that Inuit depended on. But their pups have these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful white coats. Uh, and they pup in the south. They pupped in the White Sea in, uh, in uh, Russia, off the coasts of uh, Norway, the ice front near Norway and Svalbard, and the ice front near Newfoundland in Canada. So further to the south, um, than where the Inuit lived in Canada and Greenland. And they were hunted by people from Newfoundland, uh, Canadians from, from Newfoundland, uh, to, pr to provide these white pelts to the fur market. Um, and this was thought to be cruel, to kill these very young pups for their coats. And Brigitte Bardot was one of the most famous celebrities, that's her in this photo, she was a French actress, was one of the most famous celebrities that tried to call attention to this hunt. Uh, uh, in her view, it was immoral to be hunting these seals for their fur. And it was, this hunt was uh, thought of as inhumane. But this hunt did not involve any Inuit people. Uh, it mostly implicated uh, Russian and Norwegian and Newf Newfoundland hunters, Canadian hunters. And this is what it looked like. This is why people thought it was immoral. Um, these small uh, seals were often um, not, they were not shot, they were bludgeoned with uh, that hammer there that the Norwegians invented, it's called a hakapik. It was brought down on the skull of the animal to kill it very quickly um, and without damaging the pelt. The death was instantaneous, but it does look very dramatic. And of course, 
um, butchering the, the animal to take its fur on, on white snow and ice makes the blood stand out very strongly. And so for people who did not live a natural life uh, close to nature in southern countries, they found this very difficult to see and uh, the thought of it as cruel and immoral. And so ultimately, uh, a ban on this activity was brought in. There was a ban in the, in the United States in, in 1972, um, a ban in Europe in 1983. There was also a ban in Russia on hunting white coats and on, on uh, seal fur, trading seal fur and using it uh, to make for coats or other items. Okay. And that ban was devastating to communities in, in Nunavut. In, uh, this is a picture of Khaluit, um, where I used to live on Baffin Island in, uh, near to Greenland. It was devastating to communities in Greenland as well. The 1983 ban instantly impoverished these communities. They, the government of the Northwest Territories, which was the government um, that looked after these communities in 1983 when the ban in Europe came in, this was the major ban, the ban in Europe in 1983, because Europe was the center of the, of the fur trade. So when Europe put the ban on, that was what finally killed the market. Um, this gov the government of the Northwest Territories estimated that 60% of the community income, the income that was coming into these communities disappeared, it vanished. 60% of the income vanished. So the, these communities were instantly impoverished. I'm not quite sure where these um, marks are coming from. They're certainly not coming from my screen, uh, from me. Um, there we go. Uh, so it instantly impoverished these communities. 60% of the income was wiped out. And that poverty in these northern communities in Greenland and in northern Canada that depended on the seal, this poverty exists even today. And these pictures that I've shown you now, these are not from 1983. These pictures are recent. Um, the cost of living is very high, of course, because so much needs to be brought in and brought in by air. Um, and job opportunities and income op opportunities to make income are, are few and far between. And so poverty remains. And this, the option of making a living from hunting seal is no longer available. It's no longer available. And the poverty persists. Now in Canada, in, in 1985, there was an inquiry, the government responded to the ban on uh, seal trade with an inquiry into the seal hunt. What were the circumstances? What uh, was it really inhumane? Um, how did the ban, how has the ban affected communities in Newfoundland and affected communities in Northern Canada? And there were some, uh, th this, this government inquiry was uh, brought in people from uh, many different uh, viewpoints to give their perspective on the issue. And of course, some of them would have been the activists, the green activists who uh, campaigned to have the seal hunt stopped. And when it was put to one green activist uh, at this inquiry that the Inuit had their lifestyle destroyed by this ban on seal hunting, or seal, trading seal pelts, I should say, the green activists said, well, the solution obviously is for the Inuit to adopt a more traditional lifestyle. Now, I hope you see the irony in this because it was, the, it was selling seal pelts on the market in order to buy the equipment that was necessary for hunting. That was, that was what was keeping this traditional lifestyle alive. And so for someone to tell the Inuit that they should become more traditional, was, I'm sure, very difficult to hear, very difficult to hear, uh, galling, I should say. And it betrays a lack of understanding of the human Arctic, of the Arctic, well, it's just a place that needs to be protected and the people who live there, they, if they want to live there, they have to live there a bit like their ancestors did in that, you know, hunting animals and being a bit like animals. The, 
there's no place for rifles or snowmobiles or motorboats in the north, even though the Inuit adopted them in order to keep their traditional lifestyle alive because they had been put in villages by the government. No, they should go back to their traditional lifestyle. So this was a person who was not Inuit trying, in a sense, to define what the Arctic was, define it, and define who the Inuit were from their own imaginary of what the Arctic ought to be. So this is what I mean about having a particular image of what the Arctic is, a place of fragile wilderness to be protected, can lead to morally problematic decision-making or morally problematic viewpoints. And I found this political cartoon, this cartoon that was published in the 1980s. And I think it's rather funny, um, the two old people watching the television Television says that the ban on seal hunting is destroying the Inuit people. And the husband says, well, how does Greenpeace, which was one of the organizations that, that campaigned for the seal hunt to be stopped, how does Greenpeace feel about destroying an endangered people to save a non-endangered seal? And his wife says, well, maybe Greenpeace could help the Inuit survive. And the punchline, of course, is on the fourth and last panel. Don't be silly, Mavis. The Inuit are human beings. Human beings don't have a place in the Arctic. So what Arctic imaginaries enabled or justified treating the Inuit as, as collateral damage in a battle to protect the seal? Well, it's an imaginary of the Arctic. It's a vision of the Arctic um, um, that doesn't have people in it. So this is what I mean about the problems and the way we think about the Arctic. All of those imaginaries that I showed you in the previous section, which don't have people in them. Now today, we're not worried so much about the seal. People don't talk about that anymore. What people are worried about is climate change, of course. That's how people see the Arctic, not through the lens of the seal, but through the lens of climate change. And as we all know, this is real, of course. The Arctic is heating up much faster than the rest of the planet, as, these, as this map and this graph show. This is a change over uh, the past 60 or 70 years. Um, and you can see that the change has been greatest in the Arctic compared to other parts of the world. And this is a change in surface area. Now we need to save the Arctic. Not, it's not about saving seals. We're now, our focus is to save the Arctic. Because if we can save the Arctic, then we can save ourselves from climate change. Now, of course, Arctic peoples themselves are very concerned about climate change. Uh, Sheila Wak-Cloutier is an in Inuk from Northern Quebec in Canada who wrote a book saying that Inuit have the right to be cold, to, to, to have, their, to have a, a, a normal pattern of of snow and ice in the Arctic is part of the human rights of Inuit because their lives, their culture depends on uh, a frozen Arctic. So this change, climate change, represents a threat to their very existence, their very culture, their society. Uh, and of course, already there are problems because the ice is less, um, the less stable, it's very difficult to uh, move on as people used to do. Traditional knowledge of the seasons is less useful because the seasons are changing. And of course, as we know, um, permafrost melting and changes to the seasons are damaging infrastructure and villages. So uh, modern society in the North um, is being harmed by climate change right now. And the important thing to remember, of course, is that Inuit and other Arctic peoples themselves bear very little responsibility for climate change. The climate is changing mostly because of what's going on in the South. The lifestyles that, that we live in the South, not, not um, the, there are 4 million people in the Arctic, but so far that, that I mean, that's too few uh, to make the changes that we're seeing. It's, these changes are mostly coming from the, the, the lives that we have adopted outside of the Arctic. But even though Arctic peoples, of course, are, are concerned about climate change, they're, they're not necessarily concerned about it more than other problems, such as human security, economic development, these things that we talk about when we talk about sustainable development. And this was a, a public opinion poll that was taken in Northern Canada and Alaska. And it shows that yes, if you can see number three there, 86% of people in Northern Canada are concerned about climate change. 86% are also concerned about basic public infrastructure. 73% and more, if you think about just indigenous people, more than just the 73 are, are concerned about preservation of traditional culture. Um, high cost of living, healthcare, education, these are all worries of people who live in the Arctic, uh, of people who live in Alaska and Northern Canada where this was taken, but it's true around, around the Arctic. So for 
Arctic peoples, it, this is not a question just of climate change. That's not the only problem that's facing the Arctic. There are other problems around infrastructure and social services and human development and economic development that they are concerned about. But these don't enter the mind of people who think about the Arctic just as a place where climate change is happening, that its meaning is as the canary in the coal mine of climate change. If you think of that as what the Arctic means, then you don't think about the cost of living in the Arctic. You don't think about healthcare in the Arctic, basic public infrastructure in the Arctic. You don't think about all these things. And so there's a mismatch between what people in the Arctic think and what other people don't about what the Arctic means. Okay. Now, I'm not trying to say that we can't do both. This is your, your whole summer school is focusing on the idea of sustainable development in the North and in the Arctic. And I, I, I don't think that it is incompatible to tackle climate change and to try to solve the problems of human development, sustainable human development in the Arctic, uh, these Arctic ethical and social problems. You can do these both. But when people talk about saving the Arctic because of climate change, whose Arctic are they talking about? I think it is not the Arctic where these people live, where Arctic people live. It's the Arctic that doesn't have people in it. And so the solutions, the risk is that the solutions that are brought forward don't, don't help with human development of the Arctic. In fact, they hold it back, just like the solutions that were brought in, into place to deal with the problems that people perceive there to be with the seal hunt. Whose Arctic do we wish to save? And from whom do we wish it to save it? I think sometimes Arctic peoples think that our wish to save the Arctic means saving them from themselves. So what can we do if we want to avoid the problems, if we want to avoid repeating the problems that repeating the things that we've done wrongly, morally wrongly, ethically wrongly, when we dealt with the seal hunt, if we want to avoid that when we're talking about climate change, what can we do? Are there any principles that we can use? How can we navigate across the moral geography of the Arctic? Well, shouldn't we talk about the real Arctic? Isn't there a real Arctic? Let's stop, let's stop imagining the Arctic and let's look at the real Arctic. Isn't there a real one? Well, you already heard uh, from one of your presenters, um, I'm going to mispronounce his name, un unfortunately, because my Russian is terrible. Uh, Mikhail um, Prisnyalsh. Thank you, Irina. Spasiba. Um, he talked about uh, the way it is very, very, very difficult to define the Arctic. The Arctic is difficult to define, or maybe it's even impossible to define, categorically, because it's a place, and all places have meanings. They're constructed by us. People make places. The Arctic as a place has the meaning that we give it. So there is no real Arctic that we can go out and look at. And we say, well, this is our corrective for our uh, imagination of what the Arctic is. Because it's not possible to define entirely what the real Arctic is. So what can we do? How do we understand it? We're stuck with our Arctic imaginaries. Well, what I'm suggesting is that one of the imaginaries that, that we don't have and we should have we need to start imagining the Arctic as a homeland, as a place where people live. Okay? And that's the imaginary that we, that we need to give a moral privilege to. We have to think of the Arctic this way as a homeland first. Morally, we have to give the primacy to this idea. Well, why, should you say? Why do we need to do that? Well, it doesn't the Arctic belong to all of us? What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. That's what many activists like to say. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The way the Arctic is changing is going to impact on all of us. That's always to think about it as a place, just as a place where climate change happens, not as a place where people live. And doesn't the Arctic belong to all of us? Because climate change is a global problem. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. And we have to beware of these ideas. And I, this is another wordy slide, and I'm going to take just a moment to explain it to you. You don't have to read every word on it. What I want to do, say is that if we think of the Arctic in this way, where we are, um, we are risk, we're taking a moral risk. Because if we think of the Arctic as, as someplace that's far away that we have to save, then, and not as a place where people live, or where maybe we think about it as a place where few people live and they live a traditional life. Well, 
because those people are not close to us and we're worried about us and climate change effect on us, well, we will discount the value of those people. We will discount their value and we will, we will um, put their value as less than the value of the people who are around us. And if, we, and, and if we imagine the Arctic in a way that doesn't have people in it, we also, we also run the risk of not understanding the consequences of our actions on the Arctic and on the people who live in the Arctic. That's what happened with the seal hunt. We didn't understand, we didn't think about the consequences of our actions on the people who depended on the seal. Because we didn't imagine that the Arctic in this way. We didn't imagine it as their homeland. We didn't imagine it as the place where, where they live and had to make a livelihood. And because we didn't do that, again, we discounted their value. We were ignorant of it. And then finally, and I think this is the most important, and this is about the last column. If our concern for the Arctic, if our concern for the Arctic as a place is because we're concerned about ourselves and we're concerned about climate change effect on us, then do we really care about the Arctic? If we're concerned about it because what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, then do we really, really care about the Arctic at all? And what I'm saying is we have to locate our ideas of what is right and what is wrong within the context of the meaning of the Arctic. And I think the meaning of the Arctic as a homeland. So if we want to talk about sustainable development, as you guys are, are, are talking about in your summer school, we have to, you have to locate sustainable development in the context of the meaning of the Arctic as a homeland. Because if you don't, then you'll be more likely to think of it as a place that has to be protected at all costs, including the cost that the people who live there are going to pay, rather than a place which is a human place and where human development and security are also equally important. Okay, so I think the best corrective, and I've said this already, and I'll say it again, the best corrective against borealism, against these imaginaries that we have of the Arctic is to listen seriously to the voices of people in the Arctic. And because I've talked about the Inuit, um, I mentioned the Inuit Circumpolar Council. This is the organization for all Inuit across four countries, as you can see from the flags, the US, Russia, Greenland, which is in Denmark, and uh, which is run by Denmark. Well, I shouldn't say that, it's not. It's, which, which is um, part of the Danish kingdom, I should say, um, and Canada. And there they are, the four representatives from different parts of the Inuit world. We listen to what they have to say. And if we learn from them what it means to talk about the Arctic as a home, then we can learn about what is wrong with the way we think about the Arctic, the failures of our imagination. We correct for our moral discount. This is what I propose to you as a corrective. And I think this can start at university. Can we also listen more closely to Arctic voices as we teach and learn about the Arctic at university? And I think we can, and let me tell you about a project that I'm working on and that Irina from, from the Arctic State Agrotechnological University is also involved in. Uh, a new uh, group within the University of the Arctic called the Lyra Institute. I know you've heard about the University of the Arctic already. Um, you've heard about it from some of your other presentations and, and you know that the Arctic State Agrotechnological University and NEFU and others are all part of the University of the Arctic. But let me, if you've not heard of it, let me just remind you, it is a. It was founded uh, through the uh, Arctic Council in order to promote uh, collaboration around the Arctic, around the Circumpolar North, in education, and research, and outreach. And uh, there are member universities from all of the Arctic countries, as you can see, and also from non-Arctic countries. There, at, at the count that was on the website, I think there may be some new ones. Uh, Thirty-four members. And the, and the mission of the University of the Arctic is to empower people of the Circumpolar North by providing unique educational and research opportunities. That's what the University of the Arctic is for. And one of the things that the University of the Arctic did very early on was to create what they called a Bachelor of Circumpolar Studies, which is a program, a kind of an undergraduate core curriculum that anyone could take in any University of the Arctic member institution to learn about the Circumpolar world, to learn about the Arctic. And there were a number of different, there were seven different uh, modules or courses that were part of it. And I've listed those on the right. And some of these courses um, are still in use. So for example, in Nefu in Yakutsk, I know is still using uh, some of these BCS courses um, to teach about the Arctic. 
but it has been a very, very long time since this program was developed. Um, and it is perhaps in need of a refresh. So some of us have come together, some of us partners in the University of the Arctic, Trent University, where I'm uh, a, an adjunct faculty member, uh, some other universities in Canada, the UNBC, UConn and Lakehead, together with Arctic State Agrotechnological University, uh, where Irina works in, in uh, Russia and Nord University in Norway, we've come together to create a new institute within the University of the Arctic, which we call the Lyra Institute, after an Icelandic word for, for learning. And this Lyra Institute, our plan is to renew circumpolar studies teaching and learning. We're going to re renew, re refresh um, what the University of the Arctic does to teach about the circumpolar north. Uh, and all member institutions of the University of the Arctic are welcome to engage with us in our work. And, but what we want to do, and what is very interesting for me, and comes out of this presentation for me, is that our intention is to listen to Arctic voices and to research the, the teaching and learning about the Arctic that allows us to question, to question the imaginaries that we bring to the Arctic. And this is our work program. I won't go into it in detail with you. You can see it in the slide if you uh, watch the recording back. But our plan is to we want not to create courses, but we want to create a specification for what a good circumpolar studies uh, course would look like, and then allow that use allow member institutions to adapt that specification to their own local circumstances. Because there's not one Arctic, there are many Arctics. There is a human Arctic, but there are so many different ones that the old program was here is the course and it can be taught anywhere. What we want to do is not to create a course, but we want to say a good course would have all of these elements. And then now you can go and develop your own, which is appropriate to your local circumstances. And that way we begin to question standard views of the Arctic. And one of the things that we're hoping to do, and I was talking to, you might've overheard my conversation with Irina about funding that we're applying for. We're hoping to be able to work together with the Arctic State Agrotechnological University and other universities in Yakutsk, NEFU and um, the Institute for Culture and Arts and the Institute for Music to understand Russian and Russian and uh, Russian perspectives on the North and the Arctic and Russian indigenous people's perspectives on the North and the Arctic so that these can be brought into an understanding of, of the North as a whole. Because uh, there's, a, there's a bit, I think, of a gap in, in understanding that in, in Western countries. And we want to bring this all together so that we are now questioning these imaginaries of the Arctic that I think lead us down the wrong path. And we'll also want to listen to you as students as well. This program will have regular undergraduate conferences where students can come together and share their learning experience and their ideas of the Arctic, their research, um, and engage in joint learning activities. And one of these learning activities might be model Arctic Council simulations, which are um, one of the things that I run, I run a number of different model Arctic Council simulations where students play the role of diplomats to the Arctic Council from Russia, from the Inuit Circumpolar Council, from all of the participants in the Arctic Council. And therefore students can also then have a voice in thinking about sustainable development in the Arctic, uh, which could be discussed at a model Arctic Council. And these, these activities could help uh, question different kinds of imaginaries and also feed into um, the way we develop teaching and learning about the North. And so I said I would uh, uh, introduce myself at the end, uh, so let me leave off by saying perhaps uh, I, I hope that maybe I will see you at one of our future undergraduate conferences. Um, we hope that they will all be face to face in the future, um, and, and I hope maybe that you will be able to participate in them and I, and I will see you there. And this is just a little bit about me. Um, Irene has already mentioned that I, I, I'm appointed at Trent. I've mentioned uh, these model Arctic Council simulations that I run, um, which I'd be happy to speak with you about more. I used to live and work in the Arctic, um, now in the UK, but I used to live and work in Nunavut on Baffin Island. Um, for me, the Arctic is a homeland and Arctic philosophy is my passion. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you about Arctic philosophy as I see it and the moral geography of the Arctic. I'm happy to take any questions that any 